All right, hi everyone, welcome back. Again, it's Officer Partham and Justice. Uh, what we want to do today is continue reading the book called Murphy Gold Rush, the one that's set in 1900. Uh, we're going to work on chapters two and three today. So we last left off with, I think his name was Murphy, if I remember correctly, and he had just bit through his uh, rope that was holding him on the collar and he took off through the streets of Nil. All right, let's keep going. Chapter 2, Nome, June 6, 1900. The sun peeked over the horizon as I trotted down the snow-packed street. A few flakes swirled from the graying sky, but the storm had ended. Wood buildings flanked each side of the narrow way, leaning in the wind. Shutters banged. Ahead of me, music and friendly sounds came from one of the lighted buildings. A group of men stood on the stoop. I approached them with a wag of my tail. Get out of here, skinny cur. One of the men threw a snowball at me. There should be a law that says any stray lurking on Front Street can be shot, another said, flicking his cigarette at my feet. Law? A third asked with a chuckle. What's that? I slunk into the shadows where a pack of dogs tussled over food. My insides rumbled emptily. One of them growled at me, and I flattened my ears and looked at the ground. When they saw I was not a threat, they kept eating. But I knew from their bristled hair that I wasn't welcome. I smelled salty water, water meant fish. I trotted from the street to a stretch of frozen sand by the sea. As the sun rose higher, it glistened off piles of snow. I gazed toward the horizon, listening to the crash and boom of the ice breaking apart. Row after row of tents extended to the edge of the water. Sleepy-eyed men were slowly emerging from some of them. My ears pricked. Were they friendly, or would they treat me the way Carlick had? Tired now, I walked among them, hoping for a, hoping for a whistle or an encouraging. Hey, bro, here, boy, have a bite of breakfast. A few glanced my way, and those who did had hard, uninviting eyes. My stomach rumbled, lowering my nose to the sand. I trotted along the edge of the water, hunting for washed-up fish. I smelled decay and rot, and found a pile of bones and slimy scales. Then the rich scent of boiling walrus reached me. Under the wood pilings of a dock, an Inupiaq family camped. They wore fur hoods against the morning cold. One had a baby strapped to her front. She stirred an iron pot over a driftwood fire. All three watched me, only their dark eyes moving. Then the largest one held out a sliver of meat. Mm. Food! I stepped toward him, but glanced up at his face. There was no smile, and I spotted a leather strap in his other hand. I leaped away. He raced after me. I galloped along the shoreline and then darted between stacks of wood crates that reached to the sky. I hid in the dark crevice and waited. When I peered out, the man was still there. Again, he held out the meat for me, but the leather strap lay at his feet. I retreated into my hiding place. There was no other way out of the tunnel under the boxes. I was trapped. Exhausted, I lay my head on my front legs. Night would fall. I would wait. My belly ached. Many days had passed since I had arrived in Nome with little food. Dark nights prowling for a meal and sunlit days hiding in the tunnel had left me weak. I needed to eat. I trotted through the sea of tents to the shoreline. Two men worked on the beach. Their attention was on the sand that they shoveled and sifted. If they had seen me, they would have chased me away. A dog as a pet would mean less food for them, or they might try and catch me since the quick sale of a dog to a driver might bring in needed money. To a hungry native, a dog might also mean a meal in a, in a stew pot. Ooh. A dying fish flopped in the sand, licking my lips. I pounced on it. A boot found my ribs before my claws found the fish. Get before I kick you clean to Seattle. I skittered away. More men rose from their tents to start their day. I hid behind a barrel and watched for a dropped morsel or untended pot. Two men stirred the coals of a smoky fire. Gotta get to work, one said to the other. I heard a ship's arriving soon. More men coming with high hopes of finding gold. The second man grunted. That means more men with big dreams coming to steal our claim. I heard a sizzle and sniffed the air. Bacon. Once before I had risked a hot pan and burning coals for bacon, and I had almost gotten shot. I dared not risk it again. 
I sneaked away, darting between tents, wooden pilings and crates, still looking for something to eat. My eyes widened. Someone had left an open can sitting on a rock. Sprinting forward, I grabbed it in my powerful jaws and raced to my hiding place. Beans! I lapped them from the can, careful of the sharp edge and from the ground where some of them had spilled. Not as good as bacon, but at least they filled my belly. Now I could fall asleep for a bit. Daytime was dangerous. I would come out again when night fell. In Nome, that was a long time from now. The sun seemed to sit in the sky forever. Closing my eyes, I dreamed of a home filled with kind words and maybe even bacon. Night. There was no moon, no stars, but front street was lighted by torches and lanterns. Music and laughter rang from buildings brimming with people. Men strode down the wooden walkways and staggered into the muddy streets. I stuck to the lighted byways, searching for food left in trash cans or bones tossed from a doorway. A man lay sprawled on his back in an alley. Though he seemed to be no threat, I gave him a wide berth. A man lay, uh, my nose picked up the scent of bread. A half-eaten loaf, soggy and dirty, poked from a snowdrift by the front of the steps of a building. The men lingered on the top of the steps, smoking. Did I dare? My aching belly gave me no choice. Rushing from the shadows, I snatched the bread, ran under the wooden steps. I was gone in two bites. Voices rose above me. Hey, Karlik, was that the beast of a dog you've been looking for? Karlik, even after all this time, I knew, not, I knew that name. Might be, if you can catch him, I'll pay a reward. How much? Ten dollars. Sounds like easy money to me. I heard the clop of boots and then faced then a face peered at me. My heart beat faster. Hungry boy? The man sounded friendly. He held out a sausage link. I drooled. I was so hungry. I've been trying to catch that blasted dog for three weeks, Kylik said. Name's Murphy. There's a brand on his shoulder. If you gents can snag him, I'll throw in a round of whiskey. A flurry of boots thundered above and around me. Hurry and get behind him on the other side of the steps. A hand grabbed my tail. Panicking, I barreled forward and leaped from under the steps, knocking one of them clear off his feet. Hey! I didn't dare look over my shoulder, but I could tell by the pounding of feet that more than one person was after me. Get that dog! Fifteen dollar reward! I ducked under a parked wagon and burst out of the other side. More men leaped off the wooden walkway to my left and ran after me. I headed left into a throng of people. Don't let him get away! I was surrounded. The only way out was to knock someone over. I was about to jump when I heard the crack of a whip. Let me at him, Karlik said. I sank to my belly. Pushing through the men, Karlik approached me. Finally, I got you. Now I'm going to teach you not to run away from me ever again. He raised the whip. Woo woo! A ship's whistle blasted far in the distance. It's the Tacoma, someone shouted. Thank the Lord she's finally here. Fresh supplies. In a wave, the men scurried toward the beach like rats. Carla hollered after them to stop, but none turned around. Suddenly he was alone. I lifted my lip in a snarl. Once I might have been able to take him. I used to be as big and strong as a man, but now I was thin and weak and frightened of that whip. I had known the sting of it too many times. Tucking my tail, I fled into the dark. I'll get you yet, you miserable cur, Karlik shouted, and then you'll wish you were dead. I had escaped again. I knew next time I might not be so lucky. That's the end of chapter two. We're going to do one more. Chapter three, you ready? All right, here we go. Chapter three, a friend, June 23rd, 1900. A crowd lined the beach, but the men were so intent on the ship anchored out in the sea that no one noticed. I hid under a freight wagon and watched barges heading out to the Tacoma. Chunks of ice floated in the waves and clunked against the pilings. Worn out, I lay in the cold sand and propped my head on my paws. Carlick was already there, standing on the other side of the wagon. I heard his voice before I saw him. Sure, the Tacoma is bringing fresh food, he told several men clustered around him. After the hard week, we need supplies, but it's going to bring more gold hunters wanting to file claims. You and Mackenzie have claimed land already, one of them, one of the men said. True, but we want more. We're looking at claiming farther up the Snake River and putting it in the name of Alaska Gold Mining Company, too. Carlick handed one of the men some papers. This has been approved by Judge Noyes. 
get it done as soon as the courthouse opens. Mackenzie and I don't want that river land in some stampeder's name. Let the newcomers mind the beach. Yes, sir. The man hurried off with the papers. The barges begin to return to the shore. This time they overflowed with people. My ears tipped forward. Would one of the arrivals be friendly? Would someone offer me a home? The thought made me brave. As the first boats grew closer, I ventured from under the wagon. The barges stopped offshore. Men in waist-high boots sloshed through the waves, carrying people, boxes, and bags to the beach. Chattering and yelling filled the air. I slunk closer, trying to see the faces of the newcomers. I saw exhaustion, misery, and disbelief. Their words sounded gruff. This is no Lord, it's the end of the earth. Don't drop that valise, man. It's my life savings. We need to take the first ship that's bound for Seattle. Not on the Tacoma, never again. Others natted on and on about gold, just like Carlick. Gold on the beaches, gold in the sand. Enough to make us rich. We'll go back to the stage with bulging pockets. Barge after barge dropped off people and cargo and the crowd grew larger and larger, but my hopes began to fade. No one seemed to have a kind word for a dog. Then I heard it, excited chattering like a noisy gull arriving for spring. Mama, we're here. This must be the pot at the end of the rainbow, just like in my books. I peered toward the water. A woman and a girl were riding on the shoulders of two burly men who carried them through the surf to the beach. But where is the golden sand? The girl asked. In the 10 foot high snowdrifts, where are the moose and grizzly bears? and the ptarmigan, and the tundra. Oh, I want to explore it all. Be still, Sally, or you will fall into the sea. I raised my eyes to their faces. The girl's, the girl's was flushed with joy. The woman's pale with a hint of hope. Longing filled me. Might these two be my new family? I hope so. The men set them on the beach, and others delivered a truck, a crate, and several large bags. Only then did the woman's expression grow uncertain. I got my sea legs on the Tacoma, the girl said, as she wobbled to and fro. Now I need to get my gnome legs. Stay close, Sally, the woman glanced uneasily around her. We must find someone to help carry our belongings. We don't need help, Sally grabbed the end of the trunk and began to drag it up across the sand, away from the water and closer toward me. We will prove to Grandmama and all the naysayers of San Francisco that we can survive in gnome. Mama gave a huge sigh. That may be harder than I thought. Grandpapa taught us to pitch a tent, Sally said, and how to build and start a fire. It's good he's made many trips to Alaska and can show us how to bone a fish and skin a hare. She dropped her load in the sand. Careful with that trunk, darling. Mama picked up a bag in each hand. My typewriter is packed in there. It will be our livelihood. Most of the crowd had moved away, headed toward the barges filled with supplies. Sally sat on top of the trunk and dabbed at her face with her pinafore. This was my chance. I crawled from behind the barrel, wagging my tail. Once it had been full and silky, now it was dirty and thin. As I crept toward her, I lifted my lip in a grin, hoping she would see the dog I used to be. Sally's mouth dropped open and her eyes filled with wonder. She dropped to her knees and wrapped her arms around me. Oh, you are the most handsome animal I have ever seen. Sally! Mama's voice was harsh and I cringed. What are you doing? That creature is huge and look, he is snarling. Get away from him before he bites you. He is not snarling, Sally scoffed. That is a smile. He is welcoming us to know. He is dirty. He must be a stray. No, he has a name. Her fingers found my collar. Look, his brass tag says Murphy. Then he has a home to go to. Leave him be. We have enough to worry about. We must find a hotel to stay in before night falls. It won't be dark until midnight. Sally ran her fingers gently down my spine. And he does not have a home. He's skin and bones and there are scars under his fur. He needs a washing and brushing and a good meal. You and I need a washing and brushing and a good meal. Mama pushed a stray hair under her hat. Two men approached. Their smiles were pleasant, but I felt the threat of danger that hung around them. There were few women in Nome, and even fewer girls. What did these men want with Mama and Sally? My hackles rose. Ma'am, one tipped a dirty hat, we'll help you with your luggage. Thank you, but no. Mama's voice was gracious, but she sounded anxious. The larger one stepped closer. I wasn't asking for your permission. Actually, there's a picture.
picture there. Okay. Sally grabbed my collar, and she wasn't asking for your assistance. Now leave us be, or I will command my dog to attack. I growled, hoping to sound brave. Could they sense I was not? The men glanced at me, then at Sally. For someone so little, her courage was so big. Next time, perhaps, ma'am, one said, they disappeared into the throng of people in freight. Sally blew out her breath. See, Murphy has already proved that he's our protector. She, she enveloped me in another hug. No one may be our salvation, but it will also be dangerous. We need him, Mama, as much as he needs us. I think you're right, my brave but foolish daughter. Thank you for welcoming us to know, Murphy. Mama patted me then, and I could feel the exhaustion in her touch. We have meager supplies and no firm plans for where to stay for the night. But if you would like, you're invited to join our small family. Family. I gave Sally a slobbery kiss, <laughs> then nuzzled Mama's head. Stooping, she gave me a hard hug, and I saw tears glimmering in her eyes. That's the end of chapter three. What'd you think? Did you like it? Yeah, way cool. I, I'm actually really enjoying this book. I hope you guys are enjoying it too. And uh, take care and stay healthy till next time. Thank you.